Hello and good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Welcome to yet another session of Master Series. We have the Master Series webinar on clinically enriching topics every Wednesday, 3 p.m. Today, our speaker is Dr. Preeti Dhande, and the topic chosen for today is drug discovery and development. Special reference to preclinical pre research, phases of research, and need for clinical research for new drug discovery. We have Dr. Preeti here with us today. She is a professor of pharmacology at Bhartiya Vidyapeet Medical College with a teaching experience of more than two decades. She is also the head of clinical pharmacy and pharmacovigilance department, Bharti Hospital and Research Center in Pune. Academician and researcher Dr. Dhande's special interest lies in neuropsychopharmacology, utilization studies, herbal medicine, and pharmacovigilance studies. She has contributed to more than 30 original articles review articles and index journals uh, case reports. On behalf of DocLexis, I would like to welcome uh, you, Dr. Uh, Preeti, for today's session. We are invited to have you on board. Thank you, Darshika. So, as she has already introduced me, I'm not going to the details. I'm Dr. Preeti here and in front of you to present my topic of drug discovery and development. It's a very, very huge topic each slide which I'm going to present can be a whole day workshop itself or seminar itself. But this, this is just an overview. Every one of us can't be doing all these things because it involves a lot of researchers and a huge teamwork. But this will be a glance through the whole process in my presentation. And in case there are a few questions, I would be very happy to answer them at the end. So I shall share my screen and begin my presentation. So we are going to go through the journey of drug discovery and development. Before we actually go through it, let us, in brief, see what does a drug mean. So a drug is any substance that causes change in an organism's physiology, pathology, or psychology when it is consumed. It can also be called as a medication or medicine, which can be a chemical substance used to treat, cure, prevent, or diagnose a disease or to promote well-being of the human being. So let us glance through what are we going through in this talk. These are the steps in the drug discovery and development. We will talk in a little bit details briefly through the presentation. What is visible on your screen is just the timelines of these steps. And if you count them in total, maybe more than 12 to 15 years together. So that all is the time period needed for a single drug to come up as a medicine for clinical use. These steps in drug discovery and development involve early drug discovery in which a new compound is synthesized and the target on which it is going to act is identified. These are all in vitro tests which are conducted in this early drug discovery. We are going to discuss these in details. This follows the preclinical studies where the drug would be screened for its activity, it would be evaluated for its pharmacological actions, its pharmacokinetics would be studied, and short term toxicity testing would be done. This would give us an idea whether it is eligible to be taken ahead in human trials. After the report of preclinical studies is done, it goes for scrutiny and grant of permission for clinical trials. And then, after it is approved over here, a formulation is made pharmaceutically, which can be suitable for use in human beings. And an assay method is standardized by which we can assay or analyze this medicine in human body. This follows the phases of clinical trials or clinical studies where the drug goes through phase one, two, and three, and along with it parallelly, the drug also undergoes long-term animal toxicity testing. Once it is eligible after the phase three, a new drug application for its marketing can be applied. And then once it is marketed and available for general use and public for patients, it undergoes post-marketing surveillance, that is phase four. This is a huge process and to summarize this on the next slide i have a picture to show you what exactly happens with these drugs which are discovered 
or compounds which are discovered in the initial phases. And it would be very astonishing to understand that you can see the funnel which is widened at the top and going on narrowing at the bottom. And the top is the number of compounds which enter the stage one for drug discovery. There are thousands of compounds which enter the stage, but only a few hundreds of them eligible are, become eligible for preclinical development. And very few of them, less than tens of them, of course, go into clinical development. Because here, these are the steps where all these processes are scrutinized that is this drug really eligible, really effective, and safe to be used on human beings. And ultimately, a single compound of it comes out for regulatory approval. So this is what ultimately is the fate. It is not that easy. We've already seen how much time it takes, years together, more than 12 to 15 years, for a single compound to come up as a medicine for an ailment. And of course, not only time, but it also involved a lot much of expenditure, a lot much of human effort, infrastructure, and so on. But ultimately, only one compound makes it for the market. So this is the process we are going to go through. How is the drug discovered and developed preclinically and clinically? So when we talk of inventing a drug or discovering a drug, let us go through the various methods from the olden era till the current one. Now, these methods not only involve discovering a drug, but also involves certain modern era techniques in which these drugs are developed in the initial stages before they become eligible to be used in human beings. Serendipity. We are going to go through all of these with simple examples. By chance, by accident, drugs have been discovered in the olden era. Of course, the natural resources have been explored, that is the plants, the animals, and even microorganisms for discovering or getting drugs. Targeted chemical synthesis, various chemical formula used, chemical knowledge used, and the target identified on which these drugs or compounds can be used. Rational approach, where this is what pharmacologically we usually tend to give an example of, that rationally thinking about the target and developing the drug, particularly for the target which is effective and less toxic. That is the rational approach in drug discovery. And now, Coming to the current trend, what is the current trend in today's drug discovery and development? We have various methods like molecular modeling, combinatorial chemistry, and of course, this is the era of biotechnology, without which our drug discovery and development process won't be progressing to what it is, to the extent to which it is there currently. So going to the first age-old method of drug discovery, that is serendipitous drug discovery, this is by chance. And the most apt example I can cite over here is the discovery of penicillin by Alexander Fleming in his lab. Alexander, going to the first age-old method of it was developed on an accidentally contaminated Staphylococcus culture plate. He found that this mold was not allowing culture plate. He found that this mold was not allowing the Staphylococcus organism to flourish, to divide. And then it ignited his mind to find out what is in this mold that is preventing the organism from developing or from dividing. And then was discovered penicillin. The mold was Penicillium notatum, from which drug penicillin was discovered, and this was the by chance discovery. There are many such examples in history of pharmacology where we can see that serendipitously drugs were discovered. Next, yes, the researchers have explored a number of natural resources to develop drugs. To give you a few examples, we have obtained drugs from plant resources. For example, atropine, which is obtained from the Tura or Belladonna plant. We have explored animals as resources and developed quite a few drugs like insulin. Yes, in initial days, it was developed or procured from pigs and from beef. 
nowadays we have the human insulin and the recombinant technology available but initially when it was available as a medicine it was obtained from animals and of course we have not left the smallest of the natural resource that is the microorganisms streptomycin like drugs which are called as antibiotics pharmacology we call them antibiotics because they are obtained from microorganisms itself some microorganisms these microorganisms in small quantities they give you some antibiotics and they are effective against other microorganisms so these are the natural resources which have been explored for development of drugs discovery of drugs and drugs after they were identified from these targets then they were utilized and went to the various phases of drug development to be ultimately used in human beings going to the next method targeted chemical synthesis randomly synthesized compounds can be tested for their pharmacological activities in this method ideally what should be done is the better way to do is lead optimization synthesize chemical congeners of natural products or synthetic compounds and this will give us drugs or medicines which can be utilized in clinical practice for example histamine is a naturally obtained compound which is available from human body it is also available from other organisms this histamine chemical structure is modified by adding a side chain to it and we get a drug called as h2 receptor blocker and ranibidine is the name so this is simple synthesis of or modification of the natural compound histamine and developing a drug against it by modifying one of its side chain chemically we have another example of tricyclic antidepressant like amitriptyline which has been synthesized by altering or modifying the chemical structure of phenothiazines so this is just getting a lead and optimizing it modifying the compound and developing a drug for clinical use another method is we target this process with single enantiomers now this is a concept where usually drugs are available as racemates sometimes the racemate itself is not very effective or in the racemate one of the enantiomer is more toxic or the other enantiomer is more effective so we try to explore one of the enantiomer which is more effective and less toxic which can be superior and safer than the composite racemate the examples of this are dextrodopa which is more toxic hence not used but levodopa is used clinically in the treatment of parkinsonism we have a blockbuster drug for the treatment of gastric acidity omeprazole but its congener esomeprazole is an enantiomer esomeprazole came up later and had better availability better effect and hence this drug was utilized or is popularly utilized in comparison to omeprazole clinically nowadays so that is about targeted clinical synthesis rational approach in drug discovery this is what pharmacologists actually apply their mind for rationally it should be used two examples put up over here the first one that is pantoprazole we already talked of this group omeprazole group this is a proton pump inhibitor class of drug where rationally the target of proton pump that is a pump which is the last step in the synthesis of gastric acid that pump was targeted with this lipoid drug and we got a class of compounds very effective and the most effective drug for treatment of gastric acidity the next diagram on the right corner you can see this is a diagram which shows the process of platelet aggregation there are various targets which can be seen in this diagram i'm just going to focus on one target that is the receptor gp2b3a this target was explored and we got a very good class of antiplatelet agents so what is this rational approach it is physiological biochemical and pathological knowledge which is applied of the disease and identification of target site of the drug action is used for this example i have cited is proton pump or the h plus k plus atpase pump which is there in the stomach for gastric acid that is targeted with the help of h plus k plus atpase inhibitors or proton pump inhibitors like omeprazole and pantoprazole 
and once this target is inhibited gastric acid is suppressed this is the most popularly used group of drug if you find 100 prescriptions 99 prescriptions will have this class of drugs in it second example i cited is the target tp to b3 receptor involved in the platelet aggregation was targeted rationally and we got a very effective class of drugs called as anti platelet drugs these are prophylactically used in patients who have the risk of thromboembolism so this is the rational approach in drug therapy which are in drug discovery as well as in development so let us see how is this drug screening drug happen in today's era this medicine sciences it has entered to its fullest we have the computer aided drug design in computer aided drug design it uses methods it uses a method where some compounds are prepared from their reference structures and the 2d 3d models of these compounds are prepared and then they are utilized in further research so we use the modern era technology for the drug discovery and then these compounds are screened and in case they are promising they go ahead in the drug development process another thing what i can tell you is the high throughput screening high throughput screening in drug discovery this is a process which allows now all of this is a very high end automated system where robotics automated processes lab automation and all these things are involved in drug screening and development it usually involves preparation of samples or compounds from whatever information is there and these are all of course computer generated information these then compounds go through various methods of lab investigation and on robotic workstation they are investigated screened and whatever data is utilized or whatever data is available that is then analyzed to see whether this compound is promising of course it needs high end infrastructure a lot of money because these things are costly but yes to some extent it can shorten the process of drug discovery and development only the compounds which come up promising in these will go ahead in the development stages of clinical or preclinical studies the 3d structure of receptors and enzymes to design targeted compounds in this the computer programs are used to optimize the 3d structure of the candidate drug so that exactly fits the target site and we have favorable parameter candidates if we get such a good model of a drug we can then go take it ahead in the further drug development process so this is a simple method of molecular modeling but yes of course it involves great technology next is combinatorial chemistry what you can see on the right hand side of the slide is there are just few molecules you can see there are permutations and combinations done over here and this method involves the chemical groups are combined in a random manner to get innumerable compounds these compounds then are subjected to the high throughput screening on cells genetically engineered microbes receptors enzymes or whatever we are targeting with them and this all happens in automated assay systems which are robotically controlled so this is an era of technology and this is also used in the drug discovery and development process so these are the methods which are recently in use for drug development and design and lastly the most important one is biotechnology we have many molecules which are in clinical use which have been developed by the method of biotechnology we have the human growth hormone human insulin interferons and various monoclonal antibodies used for various diseases which were untreatable uncurable in previous era and now these drugs have been developed by the method of biotechnology by the advances in technology and this is one example i have put down over here pictorially to tell you how human insulin is produced it involves the human pancreas cell and a bacterium where 
either you get a recombinant bacterium by introduction of the insulin producing gene into the DNA of the bacteria. This recombinant bacteria is then fermented in a tank and ultimately on extraction and purification of this product, you get the human insulin for use in diabetic patients. So this is how biotechnology has advanced to the level that we can produce insulin from this technological advances. Tissue engineering is a similar concept, which is again using biotechnology as a base. The diseased or the damaged tissue in the body, from this, the stem cells, proteins, and growth factors are procured, and a 3D tissue scaffold is prepared. This scaffold can be then used to study the disease models in vitro. For tissue engineering, it can be used for further process of drug development and in vivo regeneration of tissue also can be done with the help of this 3D tissue scaffold. Various therapeutic areas have been explored with this method of tissue engineering, which involves the skin structure, bone, cardiac muscle, skeletal muscle, the nerves, blood vessels, but it is not restricted to all these tissues and organs. And many areas therapeutically have been advantaged with the tissue engineering process, which has hastened the process of drug discovery and development. Going ahead, organ on a chip. What you can see in the picture that the two fingers are holding in a very small chip. It looks like on a computer microchip, a stick, where it is just made of a simple polymer. But it is not just a blank stick. You can see there are small channels on it. These channels and the small chip make up the organ. You can believe this is an organ on a chip. This is designed as accurate model of the structure and function of human organs. The first organ on a chip was developed as a lung. So various organs on a chip which have been developed till today are lungs, liver, brain, heart, blood vessel and so on. Researchers can test the varied effects of potential drugs across the entire body before testing on human beings. If it comes out to be promising at this step, it can go ahead and clinicize. This can also be one of the methods to avoid the preclinical testing. The channels, what you can see over here, these are microfluidic channels which are lined by human cells. And in this microchip, small chip, physiologically and mechanically, an environment is developed to which an organ or a tissue will be exposed in a normal human body, an intact human body. So this organ is prepared in that way and then researchers can explore the various compounds and study the effect of those compounds on this particular organ which is on a small chip. So this, these are the advantages which have come up in the process of drug discovery and development. The story doesn't end over here. You have got compounds, you've tested upon, you screened them, but still you need to go ahead in the process so that it comes up in the market ultimately. Now let us come up with the further step in drug research and development, that is importance of preclinical studies. Now you will wonder when you've done so many things in the drug screening process, why these preclinical studies are needed and what is involved in this? These preclinical studies involve animal studies and the importance of these lies on this slide. These studies are important to determine the effective dose, toxic dose, pharmacological activity and so on of the particular compound you have discovered. This needs to be done for kinetic profile of the drug. How does it behave in the body of the patient? You will get an idea once it is given to the animals. You can also determine what would be the appropriate route of administration of the drug so that it ultimately affects. This preclinical study step is necessary to check for the safety profile of the drug in experimental animals before its use in human beings. And of course, it is one of the regulatory requirements due to which you need to do these preclinical studies. So what is involved in this and to whom this is related to? Preclinical studies are usually done initially on small animals like rodents, mice, rats, guinea pigs and all. Later on, primates can also be used for the studies. What is studied? The compounds which have been invented, discovered, are screened for their pharmacological activity. Then, 
they are tested on animal models of human disease. Okay, for human disease be made in the form of animal model. Let us see which animal models which are available. I have that on one of the slides. Systemic pharmacology of these compounds, including how do they act, what is their target, how do they modify the system, all that can be studied with this free clinical drug evaluation step. Pharmacokinetic studies are done to understand where it is absorbed from, whether it reaches the circulation, what does it target, how it is eliminated, how it is metabolized, all these studies can be conducted. And of course, we have also to see whether it is safe to be used. If it is safe in animals, of course, we will carry it forward in human beings if it is effective. All this is done in the preclinical drug evaluation stages. This is what I was talking about, animal models of human disease. So we have animal models which can mimic human diseases like epilepsy. So we have kindling seizures which can be developed in rat models. We have genetically or experimentally induced hypertensive rats. We have streptococcus induced diabetes mellitus in rats on which anti-diabetic drugs can be evaluated. And we have irritant induced inflammation in mice or rats where anti-inflammatory drugs can be studied. So similarly, these are few examples. There are many such animal models which have been developed which mimic the human disease. Drugs, if they come up to be effective in these models, they can be taken forward after their toxicity tests are Coming to the toxicity testing, there are not many toxicity tests which can be conducted in animals. When they are found to be safe, in what dose they are found to be safe and effective, then that dose can be extrapolated. In human dose, we have formulas for that, and then we can take them forward in the human stages. First is the acute toxicity. Single escalating doses of the compound are given to small animals. Their overt effects and Effect on mortality is observed for about one to three days. The lethal dose 50, that dose which kills 50% of the animals in the research, that dose is determined and organ toxicity studied by histopathology. So, following acute toxicity, you get an appropriate dose which you do the subacute toxicity where repeated doses of the drug are given for two to 12 weeks. It depends upon how long you're going to use the drug. The doses are selected based upon the effective dose 50 and lethal dose 50. Like I have talked about, lethal dose, effective dose, in 50% of the animals, the dose should be showing 50. So that is effective dose 50. Overt effects of the drug, food intake of the animal, effect on the body weight, blood parameters, and other organ toxicity are examined in subacute toxicity stages. Once the drug comes up promising in these two toxicities, a uh, investigational new drug application can be filed. If it has proven to be effective and safe, a uh, investigational new drug application can be filed. And after it is approved in that, we can go on it for clinical trials. Parallelly, during the clinical trials, testing in animals continues for chronic toxicity. Drug is given on a chronic basis continuously for 6 to 12 months. And as I've already told you, it is undertaken concurrently with early phases of clinical trials. Not only these toxicity, but drugs also need to go for reproductive toxicity, mutagenicity, and carcinogenicity studies. So these toxicity tests continue parallelly with the early phases of clinical trials. What you need to initially prove is that acute toxicity and subacute toxicity has proven to be promising. You have selected a dose which is quite safe, and then you can go ahead with the clinical stages of development. So that is about toxicity testing in animals. Now you have gone what the drug is acting on, what is the target, what does it show as an effect, that it is safe, everything is done. But still, we say that we need clinical trials. Why do we need them? The answer lies in these two slides. First of all, you can't just blindly rely upon the safety reports of animal studies. Anatomically and physiologically, of course, these animals quite mimic the human anatomy and physiology. Behaviorally, to some extent, yes, but not to 100% extent. And hence, you cannot blindly rely upon their safety reports. You have to go ahead with human studies and then prove that, yes, of course, it can be safe and effective in human beings can be marketed for use for a particular ailment or a disease. 
On a lighter note, of course, animal models do not reflect human responses appropriately always. They can always ditch you at any step in your research or in your animal studies. And hence, you cannot rely upon the animal data completely. Of course, you have to take a clue from that. But you completely cannot rely upon that. And hence, you need to go ahead to prove its efficacy in efficacy and safety, of course, in clinical trials. Now, what are these? So, further the steps go from the pre clinical stages, you can go to the various phases of clinical trials phase zero, phase one, two, three, and ultimately after marketing phase four. Let us see these phases in brief details in the further slides. Phase zero is not a compulsory phase, but some of the investigators, counselors try to go to the phase zero because it gives you a clue whether you should proceed further or halt at this step. Phase zero is also called as microdosing study in humans. It is designed to speed up the development of promising drugs. Single subtherapeutic doses of the study drug are given to 10 to 15 subjects. And this is only to get preliminary pharmacokinetics data. We have already got some hint about the pharmacokinetics in the animal studies. But as I already said, you cannot totally rely upon that. Whether similar is the pharmacokinetic profile of the drug in human body, you can get an idea about that from the phase zero study. This phase does not give you any idea about the safety or efficacy because you are using a sub-therapeutic dose of the drug. So this is the phase zero, which is of course not a compulsory phase. You can directly pass on to the phase one in case function granted. Phase one, that is the human pharmacology and safety phase where it is carried out by clinical pharmacologists. In 20 to 80, normal volunteers, they are healthy volunteers, they are not patients. This is first in human study, but of course it is not in patients. It is in normal human beings. There are exceptions to that, but most of the times it is in normal volunteers. 100 to 110 of the non-toxic dose, which was found in animal studies, is used in the study and this can be increased stepwise to determine the exact effective and safe dose in human beings. This is always an open label study where everyone who is in that trial or study knows which drug has been given to the volunteer. And this is the first time human pharmacokinetic parameters can be measured in this phase. That is the phase one human pharmacology and safety phase. Going ahead, in case the drug proves to be effective in this, promising in this phase, it can go ahead to the phase two of the trial. This phase two is also called as therapeutic exploration and dose ranging phase. It is conducted by physicians, clinicians who are involved in treatment of those particular conditions to which this drug targets. These will be trained as clinical investigators, and this study. This phase involves 100 to 500 patients. This is the first time for many of the drugs that it is used in patients and patients of the disease to which the disease the drug targets. This involves stringent inclusion and exclusion criteria. Based upon the inclusion and exclusion criteria, the patients can be included in the trial. And phase two trial establishes the therapeutic efficacy, the dose range. Effective and safe dose range, of course, safety profile of the drug, and additionally adds up to the pharmacokinetic data of whatever was available from the previous phases. These phase two studies are usually randomized subgroup trials. They are blinded or open label. We'll talk about these terminologies on the last slide, next slide rather. And these phase two studies usually are conducted at two to four centers in the country. This phase two study, of course, can be again divided into two subtypes, where initially, just to get an idea, an idea that really do you need to, or can you go ahead, a phase two A study can be done, which is called as proof of concept. Whatever concept you have got from the previous hints, that is the drug discovery process, the preclinical data, and the phase one, that concept can be proved in the phase two A step. And in case it proves in this, you can go ahead with 
the definite dose finding study that is the phase 2b study once the drug is explored therapeutically and its dose ranges are understood its safety profile is understood the phase 3 begins phase 3 is called as therapeutic confirmation and or comparison this is always a randomized control trial and a double blind trial where it is conducted on a larger population larger than 500 it involves 500 to 3000 patients and it is a multi center trial safety of the compound tolerability of the compound and efficacy of the compound is studied in comparison to whatever existing standard of treatment is available for that particular disease to which your drug is targeted so this is called as a therapeutic confirmation or a comparison trial indications of the drug and therapeutic guidelines of the drug are formulating once the results of phase 3 trial are available if it proves to be successful effective say you get all the proper data at this stage a uh, application can be filed for new drug a new drug application is filed and the drug can be if approved at this application level can then be marketed and be available for that disease which will remain which this drug targets this drug can then be utilized for patients who are suffering with that disease of all strata all genders all populations of that disease can be tested can be rather treated with this drug then so that is post marketing of the drug remember whenever phase 2 and phase 3 trials are randomized control trial you have to remember certain principles for that ethical considerations have to be kept in mind the studies follow check good clinical practice guidelines informed consent is taken from the participants whether they are the volunteers or whether they are the patients of course for volunteers it is not a randomized control trial so they are bound to be the patients of the disease to which the drug is targeting informed consent process involves certain state certain contents and all these contents are to be followed are to be contained in your consent form in your consent process so that ethically your trial is genuine ethical principles of autonomy beneficence non maleficence and justice are to be followed when randomized control trial is conducted so these are the ethical considerations to be followed for rcp randomization process is needed and it means allocation of the participants with equal chance of being either in the test group or in the control group so that process is called as randomization there are various methods of randomization which involves simple randomization like coin flipping the coin computer generated numbers block randomization stratified randomization and so on this in itself is a huge topic so randomization the main purpose is giving a chance for the participants to get equally allocated in the test group or the control group that is randomization the trial can be a control trial that is it can be a test group versus a control group study where there are similar groups or it can be a crossover trial you give a drug to the group of patients and after a period wash out period you just cross over the treatment groups that is a crossover trial in this way you can have a controlled trial and blinding the concept of blinding is utilized in rcp that is randomized controlled trials basically for concealment of the nature of treatment this avoids bias in the treatment so in case you are knowing one of the patient from one of the subject for the trial you may be biased towards that that you will put that patient on that known relative or so in the test group so that that patient is benefited that kind of bias can be avoided by blinding process blinding can be single blinded double blinded or triple blinded study in single blinded only the patient doesn't know what treatment has been given in double blinded the investigator as well as the patient doesn't know which group the patient or the participant is in and triple blinded is where the investigator 
the participant as well as the person who is analyzing. That person is also rather not analyzing or you can say evaluating. That person is also blind to what nature of treatment has been given to a particular participant. Such process of blinding avoids the bias. Hence, all these principles are to be followed when randomized controlled trials are performed in phase two and phase three clinical trials. Once the drug is marketed and it is in market for use for a particular disease in a group of patients, it undergoes phase four or post marketing surveillance. Please understand this is called as surveillance, it is not a trial. Phase four post marketing surveillance is a drug monitoring trial to assure long term safety and effectiveness of the drug. It involves safety surveillance or pharmacovigilance of the drug post marketing. What happens exactly is, or what is the advantage of this phase four? It basically may be required by regulatory authorities or it may be undertaken by the sponsoring company for competitiveness or other reasons. And why it is done so? It is done because it detects rare or long-term adverse effects and drug infections which were not detected in the usual previous phases. And this the reason is because when it is used after marketing, it is used in all groups of individuals who are suffering from the disease. When it is in clinical trials, we avoid including these special groups in the clinical trials. We don't include children, pregnant and lactating women, elderly patients, patients with liver disorders or kidney disorders. We usually have these as exclusion criteria. Yes, of course, if it is a compound to be used only in this particular group of subjects, then these drugs are included, then these subjects are included in the trial. Otherwise, these special groups are usually avoided in clinical trial cases. When once it is marketed, you will understand that how does it behave in these special groups, whether any rare or long-term adverse effect or drug infection comes up because subjects or patients in this post-marketing phase would be on multiple drugs for whatever treatment they are going on. And it may be possible that you get certain drug infections. <coughs> So that is how a drug passes through this flow of discovery methods, preclinical studies, and various clinical phases. And that it progresses and ultimately comes up for use in clinical practice. To summarize what we have seen till now, we can see on the single slide, we know so many drugs, thousands of compounds are discovered. Very few of them make it up to the market. This involves a huge process in steps, designing the drug, discovering, taking a lead, preclinical research, clinical phases of drug research, review of the FDA, marketing and post-marketing surveillance continuing. This takes a long period of about 12 to 16 years. And of course, a lot of money, a lot of efforts, a lot of infrastructure, and as you see, only one of it makes up a lot of disappointment also is associated. So that is what is drug discovery and development process, which is a huge process, which we are trying to shorten up with the new era technology process, which we have already discussed in the initial slides of this topic. So biotechnology, the other methods of modeling and all 3D models, Combinatorial chemistry, all these methods are trying to shorten it. But of course, whatever regulations are needed for the drug to come up in the market that need to be followed. Few processes can be shortened and we can get a lead and then progress. In case it is not promising at any level, you have to hold your research at that level and prevent it from going ahead because that would be unethical if you take a compound which is unsafe and ineffective. Take it ahead. So that was all about drug discovery and development from my side. If you have any questions, I can answer to your queries. Thank you so much, ma'am. Indeed, a very, very nice, well presented talk. I'm sure our viewers would have loved the presentation. Uh, so, moving on, we have a few questions from the audience. Sure. So, uh, the first question is What are the different factors that affect the drug metabolism? Now, the most common organ where it is metabolized is the liver. 
Of course, there are other organs also. Few drugs can be metabolized in plasma, in kidney. But the main organ where drug metabolizes is the liver. So the factors which determine the process of metabolism are what is the status of that organ, whether the organ is normal or diseased, and diseased to what extent. And for metabolism, enzymes are involved. In case there is co-administration of drugs which are inducing enzymes or inhibiting enzymes, that will also affect the process of metabolism. So these are few of the things. And of course, there would be some drugs which would compete for metabolism. So all these drug interactions for competition for metabolism, all these factors determine how a drug would be met, ultimately metabolized and eliminated. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, can you enlighten us on the animal ethics and regulations for conducting animal trials? When we talk of ethics in animal research, we have to understand certain principles that we used. There are guidelines, of course, for performing animal experiments. We have the CPCSA guidelines. We, for toxicity testing, we have the OECD guidelines. Whenever we perform animal research, we have to understand there are five R's. Initially, these were only three R's. Now, I understand these R's are not only in research, but they are everywhere. Not only in human research, but everywhere. So, these R's usually have to be followed. That is, replace. As far as possible, if you can replace. And we have seen certain methods. We have seen the methods of organology. We have seen the method of technology where animals can be replaced with these techniques. The replacement of the animals in case it is possible. The reduction of the number of animals. Use only those number of animals which are needed for statistics, of course. Don't expose them, uh, not many of them, because that would be unethical. Reuse them if possible. After a washout period, if the drug is eliminated out of the body, you can reuse it for some other testing. Or for maybe some demonstration or so, which we do in our medical colleges. Those which we have already used in some research, we use them for demonstrations or experimentation for those Next is mechanical. Of course, refine the process so that it is quite refined. You can use minimum animals with best experimental models and get ultimate results. And of course, lastly, because this, these are living creatures, after you have completed your experimentation, you have to rehabilitate them. These are the five R's and the ethical principles and guidelines you need to follow when you do animal research. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, the next question is, uh, what is the importance of pharmacogenomics in drug discovery and development? Pharmacogenomics, here it means that the whole genome, it is influencing how the drug would actually affect or uh, how the response to the drug would affect because of the genomic differences in individuals. Pharmacogenetics and genomics many a times interchangeably are they, they are used. Ultimately, when we talk about genetics, it is that how one single gene affects the response of a drug. And when we talk about genomics, it is the whole genome sequence, how it will affect the response of drugs. And when we talk of that, of course, it is, you can say, a quite mm, sophisticated technology, and hence you need a lot much of expertise, infrastructure, money, in research as well as in utilization, in marketing. Because not all, you will know, you not get a lot of population which will have that pharmacogenomic abnormality. And hence your research will take, of course, that much of money, that much of time. And you will not get that money back that much. So you have to keep that in mind and accordingly you can work on genomics. Uh, the next question is, what are the advantages and challenges of personalized med medicine development? In continuation with what we were talking about, this pharmacogenomics, of course, this can be explored in personalized medicine. Advantages, yes, you can tailor, make your treatments for individuals who have these special genetic abnormalities or special genetic sequencing and responsiveness to a particular drug can be tailored accordingly. So you can prepare drugs accordingly, which respond particularly favorably in these individuals. But of course, at a great cost. Hence, if maybe I am suffering from a disease, a drug is available, but I may not afford it. So it is that you have to take into consideration. 
personalized medicine is very popular in a broad countries because they are developed countries here economically we are not that developed we are still in the developing stages most of our population is below the poverty line but diseases don't look at that line they are there in all population so personalized medicine is, is a good concept you can tailor make your therapy but it is not affordable to all patients correct okay. well rightly said um, and last question so uh, what are the tests to assess the uh, mutagenicity and carcinogenicity of a drug um uh, for mutagenicity in animals there is a test called as ains test that test can be performed to find out whether the drug has some effects of mutagenicity as far as carcinogenicity is concerned long term use and organ effect on organs would be needed to be tested and accordingly whether it is proving to be carcinogenic because carcinogenicity is not a matter of few months to years it is a long term effect and animals don't have that much of long lifetime so you have to extrapolate that duration in human beings accordingly come up so it will need a long patience to test carcinogenicity of course with testing of various organs specialized tests on organs whether the cells are going towards carcinogenicity you also need to do certain blood tests to diagnose carcinogenicity and of course it may be needing sometimes you need to test in the next siblings because sometimes it is not in that generation but it is going to the next generation so these kind of tests would be needed to test the mutagenicity and carcinogenicity of compounds so uh, i think that would be all uh, thank you so much for answering all these questions ma'am any take away message for our doctors watching us here take away is yeah, as a pharmacologist i would say you have seen the whole process the path of drug discovery and development it doesn't come up and of course we've seen how much is put in by the researchers by the sponsors by the pharma companies it would not be a message just for the doctors but it would be for the lay people also that they just take medicines or drugs so lightly when they are misusing them or when they are blaming them of course when it is a good part no one will speak about it when it is always the bad part the blame comes up so so much is put in by the researchers by the scientists by the pharma companies sponsors investigators of course not forgetting the the people the participants who are in the trial the animals who are in the research of course so many of them are exposed to those ultimately it is not a cup of tea for everyone so a single drug comes up whatever comes up we use it rationally we use it judiciously and whatever you get as a data which is not there available put it up safety data of course put it up to the pharmacovigilance program of india add to the pharmacovigilance program of india because clinicians usually don't report at first we as pharmacologists because it is not just the efficacy of the drug but the safety also we have so many examples that once the drug was effective it was found to be safe it was in market for so many years and the time came some reports of safety came up toxicity came up and the drug was banned there was so many and when did it come up it came up because the clinicians were alert they gave pharmacovigilance report safety reports and that gave us a clue that this drug should be prohibited from clinical use latest what i can tell of was pioglitazone pioglitazone came up with the bladder cancer reports so many examples are there the data is full of the drug data is full of these examples but clinicians should also contribute researchers are contributing to give them medicines so that they can treat their patients physicians should give to us by giving safety data that's it thank you thank you for such a beautiful message i think it will uh, it goes to all the clinicians watching us here <laughs> ma'am we appreciate your valuable insights on this topic and doc plexus is very grateful for your participation in our master series session we hope you stay connected and we have more such interesting discussions sure thank you I would also like to thank all the viewers for their loyal viewership. We would love to have your feedback and suggestions on what new topics we could take 
from our speakers to discuss. We have another master series session coming up next Wednesday with Dr. Rajan on the topic of metabolic burden of youth onset type 2 diabetes. Uh, I will see you all soon next Wednesday, same time for the session. Until then, take care and have a great weekend. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you.